Uh, good morning. I'm my name is Catherine Gordon, and I'm happy to be giving today's uh, webinar uh, entitled Lessons Learned from Targeting the Oncogene EIF4E in Leukemia, where EIF4E stands for the Eukaryotic Initiation Factor EIF4E. Um, I'm a professor at the Institute for Research in Immunology and Cancer um, at the University of Montreal. And I'm also being asked to remind you that this talk, has, um, you can get CME uh, credits for. There's a button to press on, on, a CME button for you to press in order to do that. So let's get started. Um, why, why target EIF4E, which is our nickname, or 4E, which is our nickname for the eukary eukaryotic initiation, uh, transition initiation factor 4E? Well, 4E leads to transformation in cell culture and animal models and um, rescue cells from apoptotic stimuli. EIF4E is overexpressed in 30% of human cancers, and this is linked to poor prognosis. And as I'll show you today, we actually, um, cancer cells overexpressing 4E actually develop an oncogene dependency or addiction, thereby providing a therapeutic window for targeting EIF4E. These are just a short list of some of the cancers that EIF4E has been shown to be upregulated in. I am particularly going to focus today on acute myeloid leukemia, specifically the M4 and M5 subtypes. However, our findings are also applicable to some other subtypes as well. But you can see that a wide variety of hematological and solid malignancies also have char are characterized by high 4E. I should note that some of them, such as head and neck cancer, have about 99% um, penetrance of high EIF4E, whereas some of the other cancers, there'll be specific subgroups that are high 4E and specific subgroups that have other uh, underlying uh, issues. Um, I won't have a chance to really discuss the, this question in detail, but how does EIF4E become elevated in these malignancies is obviously incredibly important. We have um, a couple of models I'm showing here. You have increased stability of the 4E transcript by um, a, another oncogene, HUR. You can have gene amplification of EIF4E, and you can also see increased RNA levels through increased transcription. And I should note that some of these can actually act together, so multiple pathways can work simultaneously. The effects of EIF4E are specific. So many of you who will have uh, be familiar with EIF4E as a standard translation factor, we'll think that it affects all genes um, equally. And what I want to show you here is that EIF4E, and as can be shown by this early study from 1993, that EIF4E overexpression does not change the cellular proteome if it has effects that are specific. And um, this is in, on, the, on the left is a case of looking at for your overexpression, and on the right is a case of looking at antisense oligos, where again you can see that overexpression of Fourier does not cause a global change in translation rates. It, it affects specific transcripts. Furthermore, the localization of 4E is not, is not always cytoplasmic. It can be both um, nuclear and cytoplasmic. So hopefully you can see um, that in for instance, if we develop, if we take embryonic stem cells and we differentiate them um, into macrophages, if we're looking at these various stages of macrophage development, that EIF4E localization changes quite dramatically to being in some cases mainly nuclear, to being mainly cytoplasmic, to being again a mixture of nuclear and cytoplasmic. So this, this protein, which is a traditional translation factor, and as you know, translation traditionally occurs in the cytoplasm, um, also has a substantial nuclear localization, which is context dependent. And other um, species such as Drosophila, the fruit fly, or yeast also have nuclear as well as cytoplasmic EIF4E. So if we think of the traditional view of EIF4E by looking at the cytoplasmic, cytoplasmic content of 4E, what you're looking at here in the cytoplasmic arm is first we have the structure of EIF4E solved by Steve Burley's lab many years ago. And this here in yellow is the methyl 7 guanosine cap, which is attached to mRNAs and is how 4E associates with RNAs and recruits uh, transcripts to the um, ribosome. These RNAs must uh, have a complex five prime untranslated region in order to be 4E targets. And they also recruit 
a, a whole mishmash of translation machinery, which we won't go into the details of today, in order to recruit the transcript to the um, ribosome. We have specific inhibitors such as the 4-EBPs that can stop this process. And I, we have many transcripts that are specifically sensitive. So when you overexpress 4-E, the efficiency of their translation is elevated. And these include ornithine decarboxylase and vascular endothelial growth factor, as well as many others. Other genes or housekeeping genes such as GAP-DH don't have their translation efficiency modulated by um, EIF4E. This cytoplasmic arm eventually contributes to proliferation and apoptotic rescue functions and ultimately oncogenic transformation activities that one associates with 4E. But importantly, there is also a nuclear arm to 4E. And as I'll discuss today, this nuclear arm is also relevant to the ability of 4E to oncogenically transform cells. The same structure is shown and the same requirement for the M7G cap is in order for our RNAs to bind 4E is true in the nucleus as well as the cytoplasm. We can also see that a specific subset of factors distinct from the translation machinery associate with 4E and are important for its ability to export a specific subset of RNAs. And these specific subset of RNAs contain what we refer to as a 4Z or 4E sensitivity element. And you can see the secondary structure defined here. So this is a secondary structure element which is transferable to RNAs such as LACZ and can enable them to become 4E sensitive. Other our, um, specific proteins or specific nuclear set of inhibitors for this function, including the ring domain of, of the promyelocytic leukemia protein, ha uh, the uh, hematopoietically expressed homey domain hex, also known as proline rich homey domain, and many others are, are regulators of this nuclear process. This process is distinct from bulk RNA export. It requires CRIM1, whereas bulk RNA export uses the TAP1 and XF1 receptor. And again, this, this process is also cap dependent, just like translation. Some RNAs that are specifically targeted by the, uh, in the export arm include cyclin D1 mRNA and ODC mRNA. We can fractionate cells into nuclear and cytoplasmic fractions and ob directly observe the modulation of RNA export. And it's estimated that it's probably around 700 transcripts. I note that some of these targets, such as ODC, are targets of both the export and translation functions of 4E, making them potent, um, potent effectors, uh, 4E a potent effector of their expression. Other transcripts, such as VEGF, are only translation targets. And cyclin D1 seems to be mainly an RNA export target. Together, these functions in, in nuclear and cytoplasmic functions of 4E contribute to the proliferation and apoptotic rescue functions that have been attributed to the physiological activities of 4E and help drive oncogenic transformation. So another way to sum this up is that EF4 coordinately regulates transcripts involved in the same biochemical pathways. So it, it uh, exports and as a group cyclins, for instance, and helps cell cycle progression that way. And it re always requires its methyl 7 guanosine cap binding activity for this. So let's look at what EF4A looks like in a human malignancy. Here, what you're looking at is CD34 positive cells isolated from a healthy individual, where in green is the 4E, and you can see you have both a nu nuclear bodies and also a rim. I remind you, these blood cells don't have, they have very small cytoplasm. In the uh, malignant case, we can see we have some cytoplasmic 4E, obviously, but we have a lot more, we have a lot more 4E in general, and this is sort of chock-a-block within the nucleus of this AML um, patient CD34 positive set of cells. If we look on to, um, to uh, the a Western blot to look at 4E levels between healthy individuals and patients, we can see 4E levels are highly elevated and cyclin D1 and RNA export target are also highly elevated. If we look at total RNA, and this is using Northern blots, we see that our cyclin D1 RNA is not elevated at all. So this is a post-transcriptional event. 
And if we take our cells doing another northern blot and look at RNA export by looking at the nuclear and cytoplasmic fun functions of um, so fractions of the cells, we can see if we compare a normal cell to an AML or a blast crisis CML specimen that we have highly elevated RNA export for cyclin D1 transcripts relative to, um, to the normal controls, indicating that this fraction of 4E is um, in the nucleus of the AML cells is highly active in RNA export. So we wanted to, to I wanna take a, a few slides to show you some work that we can explain that, uh, first of all, how does 4E dependent RNA export work? What's the mechanism underlying that? And is there a link between RNA export and the transformation activities of 4E? And I'll certainly show you that that's the case. Um, this is a brief summary and we have much more data than what I have time to show you here on that. Um, and this work is done mainly by Biliana Klitschkovich Krepslich and Orly Begay. So our, our model, and I'll show you uh, the, the model first, and then the, the data, some of the data that supports it is that if we have two arms, we have, a, we have the normal condition, this side, where, uh, it, where RNAs exit the, the nuclear pore complex, where you can see the nuclear basket, and these are the cytoplasmic fibrils. The RNA cargos get released by attaching um, onto the fibrils, and then can go off into the cytoplasm and, um, and be translated. Oh, and the export factors can be uh, re-imported the, into the nucleus for future rounds of export. Now, if we take the condition what we have high for you, we actually see that the EIF4 overexpression will change the structure of the nuclear pore. And I remind you that the nuclear pore is the um, only to main means of, for, of, of, of uh, macromolecules transiting between the nuclear and cytoplasmic compartments. So in this high EIF4 case, what we find is, or, is reorganization of, of the cytoplasmic side, mainly of the nuclear pore. We see a loss of nuclear pore in 214 um, from the nuclear side going to the cytoplasmic side. And what we see most strikingly is a substantial reduction in the number of um, the amount of RAMPI P2. And RAMPI P2 is the protein that is key for making these characteristic cytoplasmic fibrils. As a way to compensate for that, what happens in Fourier overexpressing cells is that RAMBP1, another small uh, RAN GTPase, is, becomes overexpressed. And this allows increased release rates of cargos as they come into the cytoplasm, where there's no longer any steric hindrance due to having to bind the cytoplasmic fibril, but rather now everything is, is um, coming within the soluble fraction of the cell, allowing a faster release rate and faster re-import of, of the, um, the, to recycle the export machinery and a faster release allowing um, a better, better access of the RNA or faster access of the RNA to the translation machinery. So what, this, what we can see here when we look at the data is, for instance, by overexpressing 4E, we see substantial reduction in RAMBP2 consistent with what I'm telling you here, that there's a substantial loss of the cytoplasmic fibrils, and that these proteins like RAMBP1 become highly elevated to compensate and allow for cargo release to happen in the soluble compartments. Um, so what we summarize here is that FOIA affects the cargo release step rate in, in this process by increasing soluble RAMBP1 levels, enhancing recycling of export um, factors and release of cargos. So let's explore this a little bit more. So RAMPP2, this protein I just told you about, is a key nuclear pore uh, protein important to the cytoplasmic fibril. Um, we asked the question, why would you want to do this in, in terms of, of transformation? Does it have an RNA export rates? You know, what, what's the evidence I can provide for the model I've just shown? And that's what I'm going to show you here, is that the RAMPP2 nuclear pore protein suppresses 4 e mediated RNA export, but it doesn't touch bulk RNA export. So this is specific. Um, if we take two types of RNAs, we either have LACZ RNA or LACZ RNA that contains our 4Z elements. So this one is sensitive to EIF4E. And at the same time, we overexpress a specific part of RAMBP2, which contains zinc fingers, um, and we know is important for the process that we're looking at because that's required for interaction with the nuclear export receptor CRIM1. 
And what you can see is by Western blot is that overexpression of RAMBP2 does not really affect levels of plain LACSAD, but it causes a substantial reduction of, of LACSAD uh, 4Z RNA, as you can see here. If we go over and we see if whether this is at the export, um, at the export step or not, what this, what this graph here is showing you is that as the RNA um, levels in the nucleus versus the cytoplasm where cells were fractionated and RNA is analyzed by qPCR. And so in these first two lanes, this is looking at plain LACZ and it's not affected, um, which is understandable because it doesn't contain a 4Z element, it's not a 4 e target. LACZ4Z export is increased merely because it has the 4Z element in this context of over 4E overexpression. And when you add RAMBP2, you substantially suppress this. And if we now look at an endogenous RNA, CMIC, which is also a 4E target, we can see that in both cases, this endogenous RNA has its export suppressed by overexpressing uh, RAMBP2, consistent with the fact that MIC contains a 4Z element and that MIC is a 4E target. Finally, ubiquitin, our negative control, is unaffected, and to note, total RNA is unaffected. So what can we conclude from this? Um, is that RAMBP2, the RAMBP2 nuclear pore protein, which makes the cytoplasmic fibril, actually suppresses 4 e mediated RNA export, but not bulk export. And so we presume that by reducing RAMBP2 levels, 4 e can, can transform cells more readily. So let's look into that question. For if we have here, we have cells that overexpressing 4E plus RAMBP2. And here we have cells only expressing 4E plus the vector control. And this is the quantitation of this experiment. And you can see that you have uh, RAMBP2 suppressing, substantially suppressing 4E's oncogenic transformation activity by simply overexpressing this one fragment of RAMBP2 consistent with our model that it's suppressing the RNA export function. It's also suppressing the transformation function. And I would also like to just note to you that RAMPP2 hypomorph mice get spontaneous tumors more readily than controls, which is consistent with what, what we're, we're saying here, whereas overexpression actually would um, suppress this. So to continue on um, this vein, we found a 4E mutant that, um, that acts in translation, S53A, but does not alter RAMBP2, um, cannot form a nuclear RNP, um, cannot export RNAs, and cannot transform cells. So let's show you a little of the evidence for that. So in this set of Western blots, you can see here 4E nicely suppresses RAMBP2, whereas S53A looks very much like the negative control 56A. Um, and if we look here, we can see that this is, this is vector, this is Fourier overexpression, and this is S53A. And here the experiment has simply been an RNA uh, rip with 4E antibody. And so in the nucleus wild type 4E, IPs with ornithine decarboxylase and with RAMBP1, but the S53A mutant does not, nor does the S53A mutant bind with any RNAs in the nucleus that we've actually been able to, um, to identify of many that we've examined. However, S53A mutant is still active in translation. In fact, the S53A mutant can actually rescue yeast which are deficient in wild type EIF4E. And just to demonstrate that point a little bit here, what you can see is that both wild type and S53A mutant bind uh, 4E in the cytoplasm, bind ODC RNA in the cytoplasm, similarly for RAMBP1 or any other RNA that, that we've tested, and here is simply the vector control. So the S53A mutant's effects are specifically nuclear, um, it's, or I should say its deficits are specifically nuclear where it is completely active in the cytoplasm. So if we look at Anchorage independent growth, which measures the loss of uh, contact inhibition, what we can see here is that if you overexpress 4E, you obviously have many foci. Here's the vector control. And then the S53A mutant has completely lost its ability to transform cells, although it retains the ability to translate RNA. So this really strongly suggests that the nuclear functions of 4E are relevant for its transformation potential, at least in the context that we've been looking. So given that we had 
being able to show that 4E was highly elevated in specific subsets of AML and that this nuclear RNA export function was, was very high. And given that we can show you that the RNA export function is related to transformation, we were very keen to target 4E dependent export in AML patients with acute myeloid leukemia. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, the, the overall survival in AML is, is not very good, and the standard of care has been the same since the 1970s. So, in, in AML currently, you have a median survival of seven months for most patients. Uh, and these are patients who are receiving intensive chemo, um, and that's despite an initial 50% or so complete remission rate. These patients will all relapse and, and um, not do very well. Median survival is five months for patients who re receive non-intensive chemo, three months for best supportive care. And as I said, the standard of care is unchanged since the 1970s. So we identified a means to biochemically inhibit 4E, and I should say this has an effect both it inhibits translation and export functions of 4E, which is probably one of its strengths. But let me just go through some of the data to show you that this is really uh, an inhibitor. So we've done many experiments and I've just made a, a little one slide summary. For instance, this, this work here, this mass spec work is done by an um, uh, old student, Alex Kensis, who ha now has his own lab at Sloan Kettering. And what you can see is if you mix ApoEIF4E with, with both GTP and ribavirin, you see peaks for the Apo4E, for the ribavirin 4E, but there's no peak for the, G, for the GTP 4E when GTP is our negative control, so that's good. So what that means is that by mass spec, we can identify the ribavirin 4E complex. Um, work also done by Alex showed that uh, by simple cap competition uh, column where you add a 4E to, to a column where you have a cap, a cap resin, and then you can either use high levels of cap analog M7 GTP or high levels of the active metabolite of ribavirin RTP, you can, um, you can want you can compete off the 4e with similar efficient uh, with similar efficiency yielding similar ki's a similar experiment was done by uh, ivan toposirovich who is now at uh, mcgill as an assistant professor and you can see that um, the same idea of the cap column where gtp and gppg cannot compete 4e off whereas rtp or cap analog methylated cap analogs m7 GDP or M7 GPPG all efficiently um, do so. Again, indicating this is this is all using purified components that 4E is directly binding the um, is directly binding uh, the ribavirin. Finally, we've also done NMR experiments. These are done by Mike Osborne and Laurent Volpone here in Mo Montreal University of Montreal, and we can see that um, that. Ribavirin binding causes chemical shift perturbations or changes to the to the changes indicating that it's binding to to the to EIF4 using NMR methods. And so these changes are mapped here um, on the 4E NMR structure. And also just to show you, for instance, in um, in red is APO 4E and in blue is RTP bound 4E. And so we can see dramatic changes. For instance, F4E8 is deep within the 4E pocket pointed out here, um, consistent with the fact that ribavirin is binding directly into the cap binding pocket, either overlapping or in a similar position to, to the cap itself. Um, of course, biophysics is lovely, but does that really happen in the cell? So we've um, carried out a couple of experiments to show you here. Well, actually, um, this is from Wilson Miller's lab and um, particularly Philippa Peterson, who showed that if you take breast cancer cells, um, and you knock down 4E, as you can see here, that if you take the cells by their control, 10 micromolar, 20 micromolar ribavirin, that in the cells that you knock down 4E, ribavirin no longer has an effect consistent with the fact that you've sort of removed the, the drug target. So there's no longer an ability to further suppress um, the, the, the growth. And similarly, uh, she carried out a a tritiated ribavirin IP experiment where cells are treated with tritiated ribavirin and immunoprecipitated with 4 e antibody, and you can see quite a substantial enrichment in um, 4 e versus, um, versus the IgG control, indicating that within cells, ribavirin and 4 e are interacting as well. 
So we decided to go ahead and carry out a phase two clinical trial at first um, in refractory and relapsed M4 and M5 AML patients. Uh, this was a multi-center effort, including uh, Opital Mason of Rosemont, the Jewish General Hospital, and Street Asseline is the, the lead on the study, um, coordinating all the sites. Um, Brian Lieber also at McMaster. Um, and out of, our, out of our 15 evaluable patients, we had six with, with, uh, with responses, one CR, which lasted nine months, two partial remissions, three blast responses, which is a reduction of the amount of leukemia blasts um, by 50% or greater, six stable diseases, and three patients that never responded. One of the uh, partial remissions actually had regression of, of leukemic skin lesions or a leukemic leukemia cutis, indicating that we could target outside of the blood compartment. So given the, the, the dreadful prognosis of this disease and the fact that these patients had all failed other um, standard treatments and other experimental treatments, we found that we, these really striking results. And so what we did is we, we went on to try a combination study of ribavirin plus low dose ARC in a phase one trial. Uh, we found out here a couple of things. First of all, that uh, uh, subcutaneous ARC actually impeded the oral absorbance of ribavirin. And so we had to do a lot of work on our PK. And I would suggest anyone doing trials would, would really double check their PK to be sure that um, their absorbance into the plasma is as expected. Um, of our patients only, of the 29 patients, we only had 14 that had, um, because of this problem, sort of a correct level of, of, um, of ribavirin in their plasma. So of these, we had very striking responses. Again, we had one a woman who had breast cancer, um, had AML secondary to her breast cancer therapy, um, and she had a 24-month uh, response. When we had another patient who had a six-month response with his uh, CR. We had one PR, and uh, he had to come off study because of um, of a dose limiting toxicity, but he was responding at the time. We had a couple of blast responses and a couple of strong um, uh, stable diseases. So we felt that um, uh, although positive and that the, these results really um, recapitulate a lot, the ARC didn't make a dramatic difference, um, but we could see clearly 4E targeting and we could clearly um, see 4E targeting was only happening in the patients that were having a clinical response. So let me show you that. So this is one of the patients from the ribavirin monotherapy trial, who achieved, the patient who achieved the complete remission, which he achieved in the first 28 days. And you can see the bone marrow smears here. But we can also look at 4E um, staining in, in this uh, gentleman. And you can see the 4E is highly, highly nuclear, very much like the AML specimens I showed you before. And what we noticed after 28 days is um, when he was first achieving his uh, a clinical well, start of his clinical remission, you could see the 4E is now much more cytoplasmic and much more reduced. And I'll explain why that happens. It's part of 4E targeting of ribavirin targeting of 4E. We could direct, I'll explain how that happens in, in probably about 15 minutes. And what we can also see here is that this reduction in, in nuclear 4E corresponded to reduction in RNA export of transcripts and uh, of elevated transcripts in in patients at response. And so this is another patient, just to show you that it was for more than one patient. And you can see at zero, this is the RNA export of NBS1, and at 28 days, it's substantially reduced. And this is just looking at a secondary transcript to show it wasn't something specific to only NBS1. So what we can see from this is that we have a nice molecular response. We have inhibition of RNA export. Unfortunately, we don't have enough material from patients to do polysomal loading to look at translational efficiency, but we certainly are targeting 4E. And um, the 4E localization actually turns out to be really uh, relevant to clinical response. Having this localization pattern here um, is a harbinger of clinical response. And when patients relapse, the localization goes back to the before picture, which is usually a hard rigor of, of uh, clinical relapse. So let's just summarize this again in this slide. For instance, this is the patient who uh, responded for, for two years. So this is her before treatment. This is during clinical response. And I, I should say that the, magne the magne uh, magnification is the same amongst all these slides. So this, the, for, for real, these cells are slightly smaller at response. We don't know why that is yet. And then at relapse, we see the re-entry re of, of nuclear 4E.
So this led us to ask several questions. Well, indeed, what controls the import of nuclear 4E? Um, do cap or ribavirin treatments lead to a loss of nuclear 4E? Um, we see that in the patients, but we didn't have a molecular understanding of that. And why does ER4E go back into the nucleus at clinical relapse? And so this project has been a, a, a big effort between um, my lab, in particular, Anup Ramtiki and, and Hiba Zaharuddin and Laurent Volpon and Mike Osborne and Biliana, as well as Yumin Shuk's lab in Dallas, including Garen and uh, Jeremy. So we first had to find out what was the protein that was involved in importing 4E into the nucleus. And we found that important 8 is a traditional important binds 4E. I should remind you, 4E has no nuclear localization signal. So its ability to to be imported is something that we are investigating, as you'll see. So it, it directly binds. These are using purified proteins. Important eight directly binds 4E. You can see it absent from the GST pulldown. We can see here that important eight uh, that uh, in a nuclear in vitro import assay plus buffer. Use, in this assay, I should also say that we're using 4E GST that we've added exogenously, and we're using a GST antibody. So you're only looking at the exogenous 4E. So here you're seeing the, the exogenous 4E is cytoplasmic, but if we add import NATE, now it's happily imported into the nucleus. If we went on to try to understand a little bit more about the, um, the import NATE 4E interaction, and particularly ask the question, what is the effect of binding methyl 7 guanosine cap and also ribavirin on the ability of 4E and import 8 to interact? It has clear implications for, for how 4E can function, um, how 4E can get imported. So what you're looking at here is an NMR, what we call HSQC spectrum of, of 4E, where each of these peaks corresponds to uh, a single amino group, rough, roughly speaking. Um, <clears throat> And what we can see in, is that the APO is well structured, but if we if we now add important eight, you can see that this the spectrum in red. We go back and have another look. We can't go back, so never mind. Um, is that where you have the red peaks are are the peaks when you have the four important eight complex. And what happens is important eight is 120 kilodaltons and four E is 25. But the large size of important eight slows down the tumbling and makes the sample become invisible sort of to NMR to a certain extent. So the only parts you can see are the unstructured regions of four E remaining. Um, all the rest of the peaks are gone. <clears throat> if we now add, <clears throat> if we now add a cap, uh, cap analog, M7G cap analog, you can see in green that the peaks have started, they've returned. And not only that, but they've returned in new positions. And these new positions indicate that they're in their cap-bound form. And so what's happened here is that the addition of the cap has actually disrupted the important 8 4 e complex. So this really strongly suggests that when 4 e is cap-bound, meaning physiologically when 4 e is binding RNA, that it, it will not import it it will not be imported because the important eight cannot bind, bind the RNA for e complexes. So let's look into this a little more. If we do more of our nuclear import assays, we can see um, all of this in the presence of important eight that you clearly in the, in the absence of, of the cap, you have a happy nuclear import. Whereas if you add an excess of the cap, now the import is disrupted. If we take a cap binding mutant of 4E, we can first of all see interestingly that you, you do not require cap binding to enter the nucleus because this enters the nucleus just as readily, <clears throat> pardon me, as a wild type 4E. And since it doesn't bind the cap, the addition of the cap has no effect and still it enters the, the nucleus in its cap free state. So <clears throat> what we can say here is that excess cap um, impairs 4E nuclear import um, while the W56 cap binding mutant is immune to this effect. So because ribavirin um, triphosphate binds in the same spot as 4E and, and uh, as the cap on 4E and causes similar um, allosteric uh, structural changes on the surface of 4E, we asked the question, does ribavirin impede this and could this explain the phenotypes that we're seeing in the patients? <clears throat> 
So in, again, in our control assay with import mate, we see 4E enter the nucleus. However, if we add a 50-fold excess of ribavirin triphosphate, we now see 4E entry is impaired. And below, it, just for comparison, is again that same spate, a patient micrographs showing you what at clinical response we observe, which is very similar to what you're seeing when you add excess RTP here. So what we ask next is what are the physiological effects in modulating important A and 4E trafficking in a cell line model? So here we have uh, cells treated with either RNA scramble control or where important eight is knocked down, which you can see the knocked down there. And you can see quite clearly that knocking down important eight in, in, in intact cells, as opposed to in our nuclear, in vitro nuclear import assays, so these are intact cells, uh, substantially impairs nuclear entry. And this corresponds to reduction in the production of RNA export targets and also of RNA export activity, as you would expect since its absence. Similarly, if we overexpress important eight, we see an increase in the um, production of export targets such as survivin and CMIC, really suggesting that, that uh, increasing the nuclear 4E in this case is actually helping to, uh, to drive proliferation. What we did to ask whether we could have an effect um, on, on contact inhibition as our, as our surrogate for, for like transformation is we took a, and did SHRNA of important eight in 4E overexpressing cells. So what you can see in controls B, <coughs> C, and A, they're just all different SHRNA controls that don't touch important eight. Whereas if we knock down important eight, we have a clear reduction in foci number, which is quantified here really strongly suggesting that 4E requires important 8 to be present in order for it to transform cells. So what's our model? So this is the nuclear side and the cytoplasmic side. And what, what we see is obviously um, when once the RNAs get exported out, um, we can have the RNAs free to go to the translational machinery. But this particular 4E RNA complex is not a cargo for important eight, as we showed with our CAP and RTP experiments. When the RNA is finally released, then important eight can bind 4E. It also binds RAN GDP um, and, and re enter. Being RNA bound or being ribavirin or RTP bound prevents this association with important eight and thereby prevents nuclear entry. Um, once we go to the nucleus, important eight cargo releases its 4E cargo through increased RAN binding. Again, I didn't have time to show you, but this is definitely a RAN dependent event. So, and I, I should also state that one of the things that, that we observe in the patients is that ribavirin actually gets modified. And so at relapse, the uh, ribavirin can no longer bind 4E, putting it in a class that allows re-entry into the nucleus, showing us why clinical relapse is associated with increased nuclear EIF4E. So why do patients relapse? So obviously we get very excited when our patients are doing well, but we truly feel the, that, that we failed them when they relapse. So we decided to figure out how exactly this relapse, um, why exactly are these patients relapsing? And in some cases, why do patients with have, who have high 4E never respond to ribavirin in the first place? So we have to talk a little bit about ribavirin metabolism to address these questions. So here's the extracellular, the extracellular and the intracellular side. This is ribavirin. It enters a cell through the nucleoside transporter ENT1, and it undergoes multiple uh, phosphorylation steps, um, the key one being through adenosine kinase. And uh, indeed, if you knock down adenosine kinase, ribavirin um, has a net uptake problem, i.e. the minute that ribavirin is not phosphorylated, it's a, it's a good export target for, for ENT1 and gets kicked back out of the cell. So we asked our, we, we designed some cell line model systems and we saw either problems with ENT1 or problems with ADK. And so we looked at our patient populations between our two trials, which number about 50 patients in total. In only two patients did we really see a strong uh, uptake phenotype as we would call it. So 
um, in patient 11 achieved the, C, the CR from the first trial, and you can see over time, so this is at 84 days, and this is RNA, um, and this is at 252 days, the, the extent to which the, his levels of adenosine kinase relative to control, uh, loading control, have been altered. And similarly, we see a very big change in ENT1. So this patient had a substantial uptake uh, problem, and that's probably why he would stopped responding to ribavirin. If we look at another patient from our initial clinical trial um, and look at ADK levels in this individual, we can see that versus a normal specimen, um, that this patient had substantial reduction about five-fold of ADK, also suggesting that this patient would have never responded because the ribavirin wouldn't have entered, um, entered into to his cells. But the, these are the only two patients that were really strong uptake, and we wanted to know what is the, what's the explanation for the, the rest of the patients? Why did they relapse? And so um, we did a series of experiments to, to define what we refer to as type 2 resistance, um, which we refer to as, as uh, cells or patients that have normal uptake, they have a loss of the 4E ribavirin interaction, and they have no detectable mutation in 4E. So what's the evidence for that? First of all, if we take our tritiated ribavirin IP assay and we look at our resistance cell lines in light blue and pink versus our parental cell line, we see that the resistance cell lines have a substantial reduction in the ability of 4E to immunoprecipitate with tritiated ribavirin. And if we look at their overall uptake, well, type 1 is that sort of ADK ENT1 uptake mutation and has severely impaired uptake, we can see that um, Type 2 resistance, which is this same here, um, has normal uptake. So this is not an uptake issue. This is really an issue with the loss of the ability of the drug to bind the target. And as I said, 4E levels um, were unchanged. 4E was not mutated. And if you SI RNA 4E in these cells, they're still sensitive. So they still genetically rely on 4E. And this made us lead us to decide that maybe it was the ribavirin that was modified rather than the 4E. So what is causing this type 2 resistance? We use deep sequencing methods, um, and through this we observed uh, GLI-1, the glioma-associated protein 1, um, being highly elevated by 17-fold, and this is confirmed both at the Western level as well as at the RNA level using qPCR. What we've been able to show is that GLI-1 overexpression in sensitive cells is sufficient to impart resistance, the GLI-1 RNAi mediated knockdown led to reversion of resistance. The Vismogib, also known as GDC-0449, which is FDA-approved inhibitor of GLI-1, reverts resistance in our cells. And the patients in, in, the, in our, the trial have elevated GLI-1 upon resistance, and, and in some cases prior to treatment. So let's look at some of the data. This is looking at the total RNA levels of patients from our two trials, uh, a subset of patients from our two trials where we had material before treatment, at response, and at end of treatment. And you can see that the overriding trend with GLI-1 RNA relative to healthy volunteers is that uh, relative to onset of treatment, you always have higher GLI-1 at relapse. And we asked, well, is, is this something only specific to our trials, which include ribavirin, or could this be more globally, uh, a more global thing? So we looked at a, a set of patients at relapse and diagnosis um, for their GLI-1 RNA levels that had only received standard of care ARC-containing therapies. And what you can see is that seven out of the nine have highly elevated GLI-1 at relapse relative to diagnosis although two, two do not. So it's not everybody, but in our group, it seems to be most patients. So if we, we derive ribavirin resistant cell lines, or if we overexpress GLI-1, what, what, what happens? And, and what, what are the, the, um, the, the data to support it? So first of all, what I'm gonna show you is that GLI-1 overexpression is sufficient to impart resistance to both ribavirin and ARC and that GLI-1 knockdown restores drug sensitivity in resistant cells. So here you have either cell line overexpressing vector or GLI-1, and this is all compared to the resistant cell lines that we derived by long-term growth in ribavirin. And what you can clearly see is that uh, the GLI-1 and FR2 cells are resistant to both ribavirin and ARC relative to the parental, to the vector controls. <clears throat> 
Similarly, if we take uh, GLI-1 here and knock it down, we can see um, that again, the, the cells here are, are resistant and light blue is the resistant cells and the parental cells in dark blue are sensitive to both ribavirin and RSC. But if we do a combination of SI GLI-1 and ribavirin or RSC treatment, now we resensitize the cells. And we can actually correlate this resensitization with the, stat, with the status of the tri tritiated ribavirin 4 interaction that we'd be monitoring by IP. So in this case, for instance, if you have the vector, the GLI-1 or the resistant cells, what you note is that the GLI-1 and resistant cells both have a significant loss of tritiated ribavirin 4 interaction relative to the parental control. Here, if we take, uh, if, we, if we look at the, the parental cells and we look at the resistant cells, and then we take those resistant cells and we treat them with SI, we knock down GLI-1, we can see a recovery of the treated ribavirin 4 interaction. And finally, if we take the drug GDC0449, also known as Vismogib, in resistant cells, we can see here no, no treated ribavirin 4 interaction here, treated ribavirin 4 interaction is restored. So we see a clear correlation between the GLI-1 status and treated ribavirin 4 interaction in our cells. So how does GLI-1 status affect um, drug metabolism or the 4 inter, uh, ribavirin interaction? I should say GLI-1 status does not affect 4 e levels. Um, so this seems to be 4 e independent. And what we could clearly see is that uh, through our deep sequencing studies we need to look is that um, GLI-1 elevation causes an elevation in enzymes called UGT1As, which are involved in glucuronidation of a wide variety of xenobiotics and metabolites. And so what our model was is that GLI-1 overexpression in an indirect manner leads to elevation of UGT1As. And this ultimately leads to rib formation of ribavirin glucuronides, which impair the interaction with 4E, enabling cells to grow even in the presence of high ribavirin. And I should also state that not all glucuronidation leads to increased drug efflux. This is a common misconception. Um, it can equally well change drug targeting, and in some cases it can actually increase drug efficacy as it does with morphine. So this is a case of drug glucuronidation not affecting drug efflux. So let me first show you that UG21A levels correlate with GLI-1. So if we take our um, either parental cells or resistant cells, and you can either mock treat or treat with SI luciferase, and you can see that um, what happens when you treat with SI GLI-1 is quite dramatic. Obviously, you have a GLI-1 reduction, but similarly, UGT levels go way down. If we now look at GLI-1 overexpression by itself, you can see GLI-1 overexpression, this is vector, this is GLI-1, that you have substantial elevation in UGT1A levels simply by overexpressing GLI-1. And I don't have time to show you today, but UGT1A levels are highly elevated um, in the patients with high GLI-1 that I showed you earlier on. And that's published in our Nature paper from the summer if you wanted to go look. Obviously, we're anticipating the, to see this ribavirin glucuronide in the resistance and not the parental cells. And we used analytical mass spectrometry techniques to see this. So here you can see the ribavirin diphosphate, which is one of the ribavirin, common ribavirin metabolites. And here in the resistant cells, you see ribavirin glucuronide, which is completely absent in the parental cells. If we take purified 4E and purified drug metabolites, we wanted to directly see if or prove that 4E, um, whether 4E binds or investigate, I should say, whether 4E binds ribavirin and not the ribavirin glucuronide. So we took 4E GST and tritiated ribavirin, and we either had uh, a buffer blank or um, what we found is that uh, the, I should say that these are already enriched in tritiated ribavirin, so this is a competition experiment. And if we took cold ribavirin or cold RTP, we su successfully washed away um, the hot ribavirin. GTP is our negative control, and it had no effect. It gave the same result as a blank. And what you can see is that the ribavirin glucuronide also could not compete for tritiated ribavirin, indicating that, that, the, rib that the ribavirin glucuronide could not bind EIF4E, consistent with our model. So pharmacological inhibition of GLI-1 represses um, UGT. So we, like, instead of using a GLI-1 knockdown, we, we used Vismogib or GDC0449, the 
GLI-1 inhibitor, and I should say it's not a direct GLI-1 inhibitor, it in inhibits the, the um, receptors, uh, so it's a, upstream the GLI-1 pathway. And what you can clearly see, this drug, GDC-0449, is already known to suppress GLI-1 levels, and this correlates to suppression in UGT, and you get a similar effect in the presence or absence of, of ribavirin. Um, and what I've already shown you is that this causes restoration of the 4E treated ribavirin IP, and now you no longer have the ribavirin glucuronide by mass spec. So, finally, this is looking at the last data slide, is that um, we looked at primer, we looked at glee, the effects of GLI-1 inhibition in resistant primary human AML specimens. So we took AML specimens from patients that had failed therapy. So this is that relapse. And what we see is pretty expected in terms of, and I should say in blue are, are just a comparator of normal PBMCs. It, this is pretty much expected that in, in essence, these, these cells aren't really gonna respond to, to much drug. And I should note that GDC or the GLI-1 inhibitor by itself has no effect on, um, on cell growth or colony growth in this case. Um, however, in each of the case that we add, um, either the GLI-1 inhibitor plus ribavirin or the GLI-1 inhibitor plus ERA-C, um, and this is just done at two different concentrations, you can, you can see that now you restore. So you need to have GLI-1 inhibition in the presence of the drug. GLI-1 inhibition by itself is not sufficient. GLI-1 inhibition in the presence of the drug that's getting glucuronidated, and I don't have time to show you today, but ERA-C, we can also see the glucuronides for in these cells. Um, this causes a reversal of the glucuronidation, reactivation of the drug, and drug sensitivity. So as just a, our, our model, which we call inducible drug um, glucuronidation, is the following. Elevated GLI-1 leads to elevated UGTAs, which leads to glucuronidation, impairs the 4E interaction, and allows, and allows enhanced growth. And I should say you could substitute other drugs and targets in the same way. Um, to inhibit this, we use GLI-1 RNAi. We can use Vismogib GDC-0449 or also a GLI-1 inhibitor that is a direct inhibitor of GLI-1 called GANT-61. In this case, we reduce UGTA levels. We have impaired drug modification, uh, drug glucuronidation. This allows restored drug targeting and impaired growth. So what can, what can we conclude about what I told you today is that the nuclear functions of 4E um, i.e. RNA export and its ability to modulate the nuclear pore is important to its oncogenic activity in cell culture and in patients. We were also able, we were the first to identify a pharmacological inhibitor of 4E ribavirin and to target 4E activity in cancer. Um, ribavirin treatment leads to, to 4E targeting and clinical responses in patients, however those patients relapse. Um, the control of 4E localization is critical for its oncogenic activity, and nuclear entry of 4E is only when it's RNA-free. And this localization closely correlates with, our, um, with what we observed in patients in, in terms of the, the ability of ribavirin to change the localization of 4E. We identified a new form of multidrug resistance and a way to target it, um, which is leading to an, a clinical trial which we hope to open in November or December. And one of the findings that I didn't have a chance to really elaborate on, but I think it's important to leave you with, is that what our drug resistance studies also show is that cancer cells metabolize drugs di differently than, than their normal counterparts or even non-resistant cancer cells. And I guess that's something people should consider in, in the, when, drug, when, when doing drug design. And I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge um, the lab, some of which I did during the course of this talk, Biliana Kuchukovic, um, has done an awesome job with, with regards to the RNA export study you saw. Um, Mike Osborne and Laurent Villepin have done an awesome job with the um, NMR studies in Fort Nate. Anup was also on the Fort Nate project. Hiba did a lot of the work on, um, almost all of the work on drug resistance. Our collaborators, uh, Sarit Dasseline in particular, who's leading the, the first two clinical trials and now the third. Our collaborators at PharmaScience who helped us with um, the analytical mass spec that you've seen as well as provide revenue for our trials and the funding agencies. And finally, you for your attention. So th thank you very much and I'll take questions online now. So I don't seem to have uh, any, any questions online. Um, I guess I can wait for, for a minute or two and then if not, you can always uh, 
email and and uh, ask questions uh, that way. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. I'm finished. <laughs>